the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. The passing of a Jewish legend in the U.S. Senate, dramatizing the life of one of our famous Jewish philosophers, the first ever TV talk show host, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Senator Frank Lautenberg has died at the age of 89. Lautenberg, who was elected to represent the people of New Jersey for five six-year terms, announced in February that he would not be seeking re-election in 2014. Had he survived to serve out his current term, he would have been a U.S. Senator for a full 30 years. Lautenberg was the last Senator to have been a veteran of World War II. Lautenberg famously first retired and then came out of retirement at the beginning of the last decade. He first retired in 2001, then during the 2002 elections, he replaced the scandal-plagued Senator Robert Torricelli on the Democratic ballot and won, then won re-election again in 2008. Before his senatorial career, Lautenberg had a successful career in business at the payroll processing firm ADP. He joined the company, founded by his childhood friends, as a salesman and its fifth employee. He retired in 1982 as its chief executive. Lautenberg was born to a poor family of Jewish immigrants from Russia and Poland. He is survived by four children, two stepchildren, and 13 grandchildren. Lautenberg was heavily involved in Jewish causes before his Senate career. He became chairman of the UJA in 1974 and held that position until 1977, greatly increasing its fundraising totals during a very difficult economic period. He had also been president of the American Friends of Hebrew University and had established a Center for General and Tumor Immunology there in 1968. At the age of 58, when many have set their sights on retirement, Lautenberg ran for and won a seat as the junior senator of New Jersey. While in the Senate, key legislative accomplishments started with a measure to increase the legal drinking age to 21, thus drastically reducing drug driving deaths. He continued to be a major proponent of public safety laws, from barring smoking in federal buildings to motorcycle helmet laws to many laws aimed at increasing gun safety. His 1996 law barred those convicted of domestic violence charges from owning guns, and in recent months, he was rolled to the Senate floor in a wheelchair to vote for gun safety bills. The law probably most associated with Lautenberg was aimed at providing safe harbor in the United States for refugees from abroad, and which was in large part targeted at the Soviet Jewry movement of the 1980s and 1990s. The so-called Lautenberg Amendment, passed in 1989, allowed immigrants to claim refugee status if they were part of a group that had historically been persecuted, lowering the bar to allow these immigrants through to the United States. The New York Times declared in its obituary that the senator estimated that 350,000 to 400,000 Jews entered the United States under that 1990 law. Meantime, in Israel, the issue of handling illegal immigrants from countries where they might well face persecution has been making headlines for several years now. And this week, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has announced that many of them will be repatriated to other countries that have agreed to accept them. Those countries are as yet unnamed by the Netanyahu government. Israel has seen some thousands of illegal immigrants enter the Jewish state from Sudan and Eritrea in recent years. The Knesset has been passing laws aimed at punishing these illegal immigrants with multi-year prison sentences, some of which are the subjects of lawsuits in Israeli courts. The completion of a fence along Israel's southern border has drastically reduced the number of illegal immigrants per year from thousands to less than a handful. Moving on, someone who wrote and said quite a lot about political persecution and its intersection with Jewish values was the philosopher Hannah Arendt. Her life is dramatized in a new feature film, as Christian Neiden reports. The trial of Adolf Eichmann was an important act of justice for victims of the Holocaust. But there was outrage when Jewish political philosopher Hannah Arendt succinctly quantified the impulse that drove this architect of six million murders as, quote, the banality of evil. Her 1963 book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, was drawn from Arendt's own reports on Eichmann's 1961 trial, which she filed from Israel for The New Yorker. That period is the center of a new film, Hannah Arendt, currently playing at Manhattan's Film Forum through June 11th. The film stars Barbara Sokoa as Arendt and was written by New York City screenwriter Pamela Katz, who was riding mass transit with director Margaret Von Trotta when the latter came up with the idea for the film. I was actually sitting on the 104 bus on Broadway with Margareta when she turned to me and said, what about a film about Hannah Arendt? And I said, fantastic, what a great idea. 
I'm not really sure why I said that. I knew she was a fascinating figure. I knew, as I put it in my next sentence, that she caused a lot of arguments and had made a lot of people unhappy. And I knew she was incredibly important and had done something outrageous. And the actress cast for the role was Barbara Sokoa, who had previously embodied German-Jewish revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg in Von Trotta's acclaimed 1986 film of the same name. Sokoa talked about portraying Arendt's complicated personality, one that weathered the loss of friends and mountains of hate mail in the wake of her writings on the Eichmann trial. I think she was very hurt, but uh, the thing is that she hurt a lot of people, and uh, I was actually um, astonished that she was so little aware of how much pain she would cause, because it was still very close to the Holocaust, of course. And, you know, if people... Uh, if their entire family had been murdered, uh, the word banal is not something that you want to see in context with that. So uh, she wanted to provoke, definitely. She wanted to cause a discussion, and she wanted to put out some hot irons there, you know. But uh, she was not aware, really, I think, how like deeply painful it would be to people. To hear more about the new film, Hannah Arendt, from its screenwriter, please tune into the full broadcast edition of The Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. The first ever television talk show host is thought to be Joe Franklin in a show that started airing in 1951. He's still interviewing celebrities for Bloomberg Radio, and Meredith Gansman caught up with him to find out what it's like when he's the one being interviewed. Before there was Fallon, Leno, Letterman, Cavett, Sullivan, and Carson, Franklin invited audiences for a talk on TV for more than 40 years. His golden years of television and so much more now live mostly in his office. Amidst all this clutter is really a culture and a history of entertainment and New York, all through one man, television's first talk show host. Franklin dedicated his 23rd book to his viewers and fellow New Yorkers. And if you have uh, the good fortune to bump into you or me on Broadway, strolling down around the Great White Way, please stop me, shake my hand, and tell me about your favorite episode of the Joe Franklin shows. As a Jewish kid from the Bronx, Joe Franklin grew up wanting to be a print journalist like his father. So why did he turn to broadcasting? Well, I was too nervous to steal. And he couldn't be a bank robber. Underneath the schmooze, he reveals that after being injured while serving in World War II, he was reassigned to DJ at the base radio station. He would never leave his post as host. By the age of 20, he had his own radio show in New York, and at just 25 in 1951, he was approached by the local ABC station to produce a television show. But Franklin's idea to bring talk to television was initially panned as not visionary enough for air. But Franklin couldn't be dissuaded, and the television talk show was born. The Joe Franklin Show ran a record 43 years on television, with over 28,000 episodes and 100,000 guests, including Bill Cosby, Marilyn Monroe, Cary Grant, John Lennon, and Yoko Ono. Talented unknowns got their television breaks on Franklin Show, beginning with Barbara Streisand, who was his house singer for two years. To hear more from Joe Franklin, tune into the full broadcast version of The Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, Jewish Broadway actor Jeremy Seamus had his play, The Assembled Parties, nominated for a Best Play Tony. Meredith Gansman spoke with him. Jewish actress Judith Light, who is nominated for a Tony this Sunday night and who recently won the Drama Desk Award for her role in the Assembled Parties, is feeling a lot of nachis for her widely acclaimed play. So to get to do a play like this where the prominent family, uh, the whole story is about the Jewish family is very important to me. Set on the very Jewish Upper West Side on the not-so-Jewish holiday Christmas, Best Play Tony nominee, The Assembled Parties, takes a look at one Jewish family over 20 years who learns that no matter how good your view is, you can never tell what's coming in your future. From the moment the curtain rises, there's a familiarity with this family, the mother who wants to take care of everyone, the overbearing and funny older aunt, the well-educated children. 
However, cast member Jeremy Shamos says that you don't have to be Jewish to understand the play. It's not specifically Jewish. In fact, I feel like a lot of um, non-Jewish people come. There's a lot of Yiddish terms, mm -hmm. and they still laugh just because you sort of get the idea, especially Yiddish, you get the idea of what the joke is, even if you don't specifically know what the word is. Shamos and I spoke at the Actors Temple in Hell's Kitchen about how the play shows the evolution of Jewish culture from generation to generation. The grandparents are sort of like shtetl, you know, from the old country, and then the sort of second level, the adults are kind of Jewish, but they have a Christmas tree, and then the kids kind of joke about Judaism as sort of a cultural thing that they're not necessarily totally part of, but they're part of the culture of it. To see more from the assembled parties, Jeremy Shamos, tune in to the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.